And it was a number of years ago that I had a little, you know, those quick conversations with God, but I'd had it a few times. And I said to God, God, I've never really been in the place where I've had to really trust you to the point where, you know, if, if, I, if it didn't come off, I'd drown. In other words, I'd never really walked on water to the point where I had to absolutely trust God, let go of my own strength and, and abilities and say, I, I can only trust you in this. And so this, this free fall is something that uh, we need to understand and we need to do. In Matthew 5.3, we've got, You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Why don't we all say this together? You're blessed... When you're at the end of your rope, with less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You know, that's, that's a powerful, powerful statement that, that the word of God makes. And that's the message Bible. And when we are at the end of our rope, then God can really take over in our lives. And there's a wonderful story that I'd like uh, you to follow me on. It's, it's if you want to... Sh- Look it up in your Bibles. It's Luke chapter 8. Verse 22. And it says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. Please notice the first thing about this particular story is that Jesus is saying, We're going over to the other side. Come on, get in the boat, we're going over. And I, lo- I love the introduction of this story because it speaks about destiny. It speaks about God taking us somewhere. And you know, when God speaks to us, when God says, jump in, jump on, go forward, we need to always be believers to say, well, I- I'd rather be a wet sailor than a dry land hugger. I'd rather get in the boat and get a bit wet than only ever stay on land. And so Jesus says to his disciples, get in this boat, we're going over the other side. And you know, life has destiny for each and every one of us. It has for our church. And God has a plan and a will and a destiny for each and every one of our lives. And I want to say to you today, that don't let the devil, don't let previous circumstances, don't let anything stop the plan of God for your life. Amen? Because God has a wonderful journey, a wonderful destiny for you, and, and for all of us, he has a plan. And he's saying, come on, get in this thing, get on this thing, and go over to the other side. And so that's our first commitment to God and to Christ, to hear his word and to get in and do the thing that God has called us to do. God doesn't want to take you out into the middle of the lake to drown you. God doesn't want to take you out in the middle of the lake and just stop the wind and so you are stagnant. God doesn't want to take you out in the middle of the lake and and just go round and round and, and round in circles. God wants to take you over to the other side. He's taking you somewhere and some days it might seem... Well, there's no wind. I just feel like I'm going round and round. I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. But in God, God wants to take you over. God is bringing you through in Jesus' name. And he has a purpose for our lives. God is good and he wants to take us through. And so they they get into this boat and it says, As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Well, he actually went to sleep. So it must have been quite a big boat. It was a sailing boat. It says they sail, so there was sails, so it must have had a lower deck. And Jesus goes down into the lower deck, and he's asleep. Now, while he's sleeping, a fierce storm came down on the lake. And they say this is Lake Galilee because of the mountains down in the, uh, that come down. The winds can really whip up, you know, great waves on on the uh, sea. And these guys were fishermen that were there. 
And the boat was filling with water, so this was some storm, and they were in real danger. And the disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. You know, in life it's not always smooth sailing. When God sets you out on a journey, when God leads you, you know, the, f- the fairy tale is, well, we're going to the other side. woo This is going to be wonderful. We're, we're, we're going somewhere. But you get out and you find that soon there's often trouble. There's troubles that come. You know, you get married and you think it's just going to be the honeymoon forever and forever. Oh, the place has gone quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> well, you'll have arguments. But you know what? There's great fun in making up. It's not, uh, would all the married, am I the only one that has troubles in his marriage? <laughs> I was in trouble yesterday, that's probably why. <laughs> but we're good today, aren't we, darling? <laughs> They say if you can build a house and not get divorced, you're doing well. So <laughs> we're building a house with a few challenges. But you know, there's, there's, there's troubles that come. And you don't have to live long in life to realise that challenges come. But you know, when, when you, when you realise that trouble helps you understand who you are and helps you understand who God is, you can look at trouble in a different way. You can look at trouble as really a stepping stones in your life. And that's what trouble ought to do. It ought to take you deeper, make you stronger. It's like the wind on the, on the trees. When a tree is growing, if, if it experiences wind, its roots go down strong. And trouble can make you so strong. And that's the will of God for our lives. God doesn't want to destroy you through trouble. He wants to build your life through trouble. You don't go looking for trouble. I don't ask for trouble. But God knows how to work in our lives and and, and help us in those times of trouble. I've got a little clip up here. My face will say a lot of things to you. This was the moment I was just about ready to leave the plane. And there was a lot of things going on in my mind. The wind was just was just howling around us. I couldn't get my foot on the step. You know, as soon as I put my foot out of the plane, the wind was so strong, it just blew my foot away from the actual step and I'm trying to get it back on the step. And as I said before, I hope this bloke knows what he's doing here. And, <laughs> and uh, so there's these, it was just the moment that you, you, you step out. And, and so in life, when you step out, there is often challenges, there's often struggles you know, that we go through. Why did you bring us out here? Isn't that what the children of Israel said when they, you know, left Egypt and they were on the way to the promised land? Why? What are you doing? Why Why me, God? Where are you? And, And it's the what's and the where's and the why's all come out, you know, in that period of time. And so the disciples were very, very challenged with the fact that uh, they were taking on water to such an extent that they actually believed that they were going to drown. But there's one thing that they didn't keep in mind, and that is they couldn't drown because Jesus was in the boat. While ever Jesus is in your boat, while ever Jesus is in your life, you can be assured that you're going to make it through and you're going to come to the other side. Amen? They woke him up and, and the scripture says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind. And the raging waves, suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, where is your faith? You know, when I used to read this, I thought, Gee, Jesus, you were tough on these guys. You were so tough. These were burly fishermen. They had been out there. They knew what it was like to be out in the ocean. But here they were, they are saying, we're going to die, we're going to die, you know. And Jesus really rebukes them and says, where, where was your trust? Where was your faith? And that verse has always been a challenge to me, to say, Rod, how much faith have you really got? 
how much trust have you really got? Because it's not until there's a whole lot of trouble do you know where you are or how much faith and trust that you have in God. And so Jesus challenges them and really he was giving them a lesson in trust and faith. And the disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. So he, they arrived in the region of Gennesaris. Now in this story here, we just see that in God, the journey is the destination. We're on a journey. We're, we're going forward. And in that journey, there will be challenges. There will be trouble. But in those troubles, in those challenging times, God is actually taking us forward and he's taking us over. One was sleeping while the others were full of fear. One was at a place of rest. The others were in a place of torment. And you know, in life, there is the fight of faith, but there is also, the Bible speaks about the rest of faith. I think we know a lot about the fight of faith and how we keep, keep at it and we keep believing and we keep going on. But do we really understand the rest of faith? That when all hell is breaking loose around us, that there can be a peace and there can be a rest in our lives that help get us through. Do you know, as, as a nation, it, it must have been 10 or 15 years ago, they actually predicted in Australia that we were going to have a lot greater mental health issues in the years to come. And I remember them saying it. There's going to be a lot of more need for, for help in, in, in the, the area of mental health. And at the time, I thought, why would that be? Why, why is there a great increase? Well, somehow they predicted it, and they actually set in motion people to help, help others. But you know, the further we get away from God, the further we get away from the Word of God, the less that we have this rest of faith in, the more stress, the more tormented, the more fear, the more pain, the more sorrow, the more anguish that we experience. Jesus is here sleeping in the midst of the storm. It's incredible, isn't it? You know, this boat's taken on water and somehow he must have been away from the water, sleeping. And the, the, these guys are so tormented. But there is a rest of faith. Hallelujah! <laughs> because without us coming into this, life can be so tormenting and so frustrating. And as you go through these journeys in life, you, you realise that. In Hebrews 4.10, it says, can you just, uh, am I, yeah, I'm doing pretty good this morning, I think. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. Everybody say, it's going to work? No. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. But Hebrews 4.10 says, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So there, there is a rest of faith that we can come into. And on the seventh day, God rested. He didn't keep working. He actually came into a place of rest. And for us, there needs to be that place of rest. And I've found myself over the last, you know, six months saying, God, you made the universe. You made me. You can fix this. And I think that's, you know, a very biblical way to look at life. God, you made the universe. The universe is absolutely incredible the way it's put together. The fact that, you know, there aren't other solar systems, there aren't planets crashing into the earth, the fact of the atmosphere, and, you know, if you go into it, you see it's incredible the way that the world has been put together. God, you made the universe. You can make it tick. You made me. That's a miracle. 
you can work this out. And so it comes to a place where we begin to confess and begin to declare who God is. But that, that place of rest frustrates us because we, we tend to get into cycles, especially the busy cycle, where busyness is equated to success. And sometimes when we reach the end of our rope, we just want to do more. Well, if I can only do more, then I'll get out of this. But you know, sometimes it's not hanging on. Sometimes it's actually giving over. And, the, and you've got to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit what to do. You gotta, sometimes there is a place to keep on fighting. God wants you to keep on fighting. There's another time where God says, I just want you to rest. I want you to sit down there on the side and I'm going to fix this thing. Woohoo! You like that? There, there is a place for this and the Word of God you know, he is very strong on that. But our culture is very busyness driven. You know, you ask people, well, how is your week? Oh, it's extremely busy. And then there's a pregnant pause. And the person is often waiting for some sympathy. They're often waiting for you to put the gold medal on them and say, wow. Busyness is often equated to success but you know what sometimes our busyness is just man driven and it ends in nothing in fact there's a there's a wonderful psalm and psalm 39 6 says all our busy rushing ends in nothing because it's man's busyness and we got to get back to god's agenda in our world amen sometimes we can be just too busy just trying to do it all trying to rush it and god says why don't you just sit down just have a have a break and on the seventh day, God rested. Live in his agenda. We have to come to the point to say, who's in charge here? Who's the master? Who's the servant? Have we taken over the place of master and he becomes our servant? Do you know the only time that masters speak to servants is when they want something done? Is the only time you talk to God when you want something? If it is, you're the master and he's your servant. But servants listen to the master. Servants are waiting to hear, what is the master going to say to me today? And there's a wonderful place that you can come to, a place of rest, because I don't want to try and run my world. I can't run my world. I'm not strong enough. You're not strong enough. We're not smart enough. We're not big enough. We're not able to run our world. It's only God that can run our world. And that's why his name is God. And your name is Paul. And your name is Rhonda. And your name is Angel. That's why you've got your name. And God's got his. Because... He is able. Who's the master? So let me finish the story. I've, I've tried to put a little foundation in there this morning for what I'm about to say has happened here over the last 18 months, two years. So around about two years ago, I connected with the church here back in late 2013 and there were certainly some real struggles in the church, and that's why I connected to the church as regional leader here for the ACC with the church here because of the commercial property that the church had previously bought four years ago. And it was causing great financial pressure on the church to the point where it was almost in collapse. And so uh, getting involved... With that, you know, almost two years ago, my first board meeting, once the, the, the church felt to uh, bring me on as, as chairman of that board, the property board, not of the church at that time, but to try and steer a way forward. I can remember my first board meeting that we said, well, we just haven't got enough money to pay the bank. And so I said, well, you're all going to have to get your wallets out, aren't you? And we're going to have to pay the bill. Remember that, right? And so we, we got our wallets out. That was my first board meeting there and, and we got our wallets out and, and uh, you know, we, we, we made up what was necessary to do that. And I thought after I walked out of the room, 
I thought, I hope we don't have to do that again next time. <laughs> because, you know, that bank payment keeps coming. If, you know, if anybody's got a mortgage, you will know every month it just comes around or every fortnight, however it, however it works. And uh, then during 2014, um, I, we worked with the, the board here and then we came in, in 2015. And early this year, it, it must have been around March, I, it, was, it was so concerning and I thought, that thing is my ball and chain. And I want to get rid of it. And so I, I can remember the day that I wrote out and I felt to write out sale of, of property. And I, my office is back in here and I walked out here and right here at this altar I put down sale of church property. And like it was putting it before the altar. And I said, God, I really want you to sell this, that, that property. The, the, the commercial, not the church side, the commercial property down there. And so I felt good after that. That afternoon, I got an email from the real estate agent saying, we have been contacted today and uh, there's a buyer who wants to buy the property. Do you know when you do things and things just seem to come together so nicely and you say to yourself, this must be God. Do you know when all the pieces come together and I just began to, I thought, that's incredible. The same day as I put the sale down, I get an email and uh, then, you know, it was only a few weeks uh, later that they actually put uh, a deposit down for it and uh, there was going to be a two-month um, due diligence period with a 30-day settlement. So we began the process and there was a whole lot of board meetings and, you know, with the bank and with them and agents and emails and, and the whole process. But as we, we journeyed through, I just got so excited, I thought, we, we're going to get out of this thing, we're going to get out of this mess. And, and by now, um, I had been, you know, on this journey with the church some, you know, 16, 18 months. Not 18 weeks, 18 months. Can, can I just say here, that, that was a long time for me in, in this journey, but I just want to honour people here today who you have been in your journey, either through physical pain or difficulties for years and years and years, and yet you're in church today and you're loving Jesus and you're trusting God. I think we should put our hands together and just... Thank people. Because, you know, we've, you've all got your stories. I'm just telling you one here as your pastor today. But there's some, there's some stories in this church. Some people carry some heavy, heavy weights. And they've carried it for many, many years. And we honour you today. And... Uh, I, as we were, were going through, we, we got through the two-month due diligence period and then we came into the 30-day countdown and I thought, you beauty, we have got this mother in the bag. Come on down. And, and all the weight was starting to come off me. I could see an end. I could see a way through. I could see us just paying off that that excess debt, we were having board meetings, weren't we, Paul, saying this is how it's all going to play out. And each day I was counting down, you know, 30 days, 20 days, 15 days, 10 days. And I was getting so excited. Eight days, I thought, we got it. In fact, I had been so tempted to come to the church and tell you the story about how I had put the piece of paper down here and, uh, you know, to tell you all, this is, this is God. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> Eight days, seven days. So we've got seven days now 
before it went unconditional. And we got the phone call. Sorry, we're pulling out. So we had been in negotiations with them for months and months. We'd been on this journey for me personally 18 months and I was absolutely gutted to the, to the point where really I was, I was exhausted and uh, I, we, we'd all worked hard, this was the answer, this was the way through and I thought, God, God, where are you? It wasn't so much where are you, but I was just numb, you know. Because I, you know, seven days from victory, I could, I could see the finish line. Do you know how sometimes all the events seem to be, they're, they're, they're all coming together and then, bang, bad news just comes through the door and it came through like a freight train. We, we'd exhausted all of our options. We, we'd tried everything. And uh, it was that point that I was just devastated. I was devastated because all, all my hopes were, were shattered. And it was that point, that critical point, over the next few days where I said, God, and I hate saying this because this is, this is our carnal man, I said, God, I can't do this. I think it's a great day when you could admit your weaknesses because in our weakness, he becomes strong. While ever you're saying, I can do this, you're actually not to the point where you have to fully trust God. The disciples were at the point, they knew that boat was going down. They were fishermen. They knew that boat was going to sink without God. And it's a great place to be in. It's a wonderful place to be in if you've got Jesus in the boat. <laughs> if you ain't got Jesus, you're in big trouble. But with Jesus, you know what? We're never in trouble really because he is our saviour. He's our saviour. And I said, God, I can't do this. And I, I remember me saying, I've never said this, in, I've never had to say this in my life. God, I can't do this. I'm not giving up, but I'm giving over. I'm too exhausted. I'm too tired. I'm too weak. I can't do it. I've tried to fix it 18 months, two years now. We're, we're in a worse hole now than we were two years ago. I can't fix it. And you may be in a situation today, in a marriage, in a situation, in a relationship, financially, whatever today where you have just tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried. Maybe you've reached the end of your rope. Well, last year I would have said, tie a knot and hang on. But do you know what I'm saying this year? Let go. <laughs> just let go. Because sometimes in God you have to let go. You have to let go and trust God. And so I remember that point where I said, okay, God, that's it. If we go down and the bank comes in and takes the lot, church property and all, and sells up the lot, that's your problem, not mine. We will stick with the church. We'll find a rented hall. Somehow, some way, we'll get through this, but it's your problem. And you know, that helps us hand over to him because he is God and he's got big enough shoulders to do this. He made the universe, he made you, and he can fix it. And so in, in that resolve in, in my heart, I, I just left it there and took a deep breath and thought, well, I don't know what's coming next, but that's your problem. And there was a great peace in my soul. And you know, when you hand it over to God, the, the mind starts to come clearer, the soul is at rest, and you just sit. On the seventh day, God rested. Amen? I've got to quickly finish this story because time's running out. And so it was probably 
that that week and uh, I just had the thought, which I had had previously, there's a business that was in Latcham Drive and he was the street sweeper. Some of you may have seen his trucks there previously and his street, he, he does all the streets and I, I used to drive by and say, that guy's got too many trucks in his yard because the major problem with the property is we weren't, the, the real estate agents had been 18 months trying to get tenants for it. We couldn't get tenants. And uh, so I thought, why don't I go in there and knock on his door and say, hey, mate, you got too many trucks in the yard. I've got a better yard for you. <laughs> and so I did. In that next week, I just went in and uh, there was a lady in the office who I, who I later found out was, was the wife of the owner. And she said, oh, you know, he may, he may consider it. And uh, I, I left. Two or three days later, he rang me back. Oh, well, look, have you got a yard? And I said, yeah. So I think it was a Monday. It always happens on a Monday. Monday's my day off, but <laughs> I, you know, we met him. And, and uh, the amazing thing, thing was he said yes to taking, um, you know, a three-year three lease on it. And uh, so he has moved in now into the property and taken... 75% of, of the larger building that's there. Just for those who, who don't know what it looks like. Oh, by the way, those who've been to see the war room, this is, this is my, you know, I write myself little notes. On the 20th of the 2nd, see right down the bottom there, you'll see the date, 20th of the 2nd, 15. I, wrote, I read from Micah 4.10, but the Lord will rescue you there. He will redeem you from the grip of your enemies. And that was earlier in the year. And so when the whole sale came through, I thought, this is it. God's, God's the, you know, going to get us out of this. So for those who have never seen the property, um, up the top is the food bank and down the bottom there is the large commercial building. Have I got a light in this thing? Where, where's the light? No, but I've got a red light. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pointing it at my screen, but the, the light's not coming on, Jared. Which one's the light? I don't think it's... Oh, now I've taken it off. Here. So, anyway, that's the property. You know what... A miracle happened. In the next week, things that had been, you know, in the distance and nothing had come, we got something like three new tenants in one week. And so we got the sweeper guy came in and then sought recycling, um, which is a computer recycling company. They contacted us and uh, said, we're going to take the building. The guy across the road who'd wanted some uh, property for his business, he, he took out a lease. And then uh, Gateway, uh, over the last few months, they've taken out a lease. And so we've actually got the property for the first time in probably five years, Paul, fully leased. Which meant the bank then said, if you can get the LVO, LVR up, in other words, the loan ratio, we'll drop the interest rate 1%. On $2.5 million, that's $25,000 a year. That's 500 bucks a week. We, with, with tenants, it all affects that, the value of the property. And so we got the place revalued. Two weeks ago, we had it revalued. And the valuation came in $130,000 below what it needed to. And normally the bank would say, well, sorry. But the bank rang and, and, and Amanda said to us, I'm going to go in and try and do something for you. Whew. Now I'm getting emotional. It's nice to have a bank. Anyway, let me finish the story. <laughs> 
She goes, I said, break an arm, break a leg, but try and get the interest rate down 1%. And so she came back that day or the next day with good news that the bank said, okay, we're going to drop the interest rate 1%. So there's 25 grand, you know, just in, in, in that. And so over the last month or two, it's all turned around. So the property now is virtually cash flow neutral. So it's not costing us anything to try and keep it. And with tenants, we can keep it. And uh, the hope is now that we can sell it. It's not, and I just want to honour the NAB Bank today to say, thank God that they've got a good head, but uh, they've actually got some heart there. And, uh, you know, we so appreciate that. So in this journey now, we're to a place where, where in, in just a few weeks, the whole thing absolutely turned around. But it wasn't really to a point where I said and we had to say, God, I can't do this anymore. I just, I just can't do it. And you know, there's a wonderful place in God that we can all come to where we can start giving over some stuff to God. Amen? And, and I read this, and as we close this morning, let me just read this scripture to you. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I think it's on the overhead there. And I'll read from verse 8. Jared, I'll read it from verse 8. It says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed by beyond our ability to endure. Isn't that amazing? You know, here... The Apostle Paul says, we, it was beyond. It, 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 and we were overwhelmed, beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. So theirs was a physical danger. In fact, we expected to die. You can get into a place where it's so challenging. You know, well, it's all over. But as a result, we stop relying on ourselves. Hello, you're getting this message this morning. And learn to rely only on God, who raises the dead. So even if it's midnight for you right now, that's okay. God's the God of the resurrection. He's got a better plan. There's something else for you. And, and uh, I just think this, this is powerful. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him. And he will continue to rescue us. I just love that. God has rescued us. As a church, you know, God has rescued us. We're not out of the woods yet. We, we've still got a property that we need to sell. But you know what? He's going to rescue us again. So not only has he rescued us, he will rescue us. And so in God, this, this wonderful journey has helped me come to a place of trust and faith that I've never had to come to before. So I want to thank this church for inviting Rod and Rhonda Job to Caloundra because in me, God has done a work in me and in us that you know, it wasn't possible, I guess, anywhere else or, or certainly he chose here to do that. And, and I thank God that we can, even with all this trouble, we can say, God, I'm just going to rest in you and I know how to let go. Amen.